Amen. Thank you. Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. Let's start in verse number 1. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that I have given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not be any, any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong, and have a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to, the, to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we do love you. Lord, we ask for your blessing. Lord, this morning, we certainly know that we need you uh, and your word and your help and your spirit working in our hearts and lives to meet the needs that are here. And Lord, so we pray for that. We pray that your spirit and your word would have free course in our life. Lord, that this would be a help, that it would encourage us, that it would draw us closer to you. And Lord, if there's anyone here who's never been converted, Lord, we do pray for their salvation. Lord, that even this morning they would repent and place their faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, may you be glorified by all that's said. Lord, control what I say and how I say it. Lord, please, I beg you for your mercy and your grace. Use this to be a help, Lord, to your people. I pray and ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. So yesterday at the, at the uh, Women of Virtue, we had, I mentioned this in Sunday School, we had three of the ladies speak. And um, in, in deciding in the weeks leading up to the Women of Virtue, I don't know what it was, four or six weeks ago, and I, and I had got with Mary and I said, you know, we're going coming up with different ideas, the theme for it. And I was like, well, I, th I think along the lines of encouragement. It's winter time. We're coming out of winter time, the darkness. And, and so I said, let's, let's go for Starla, Sharon, and then have you speak. And Starla, of course, from the perspective of, of, of the discouragement and loneliness she can feel being deaf, um, what that has to be like. There's times I'll watch that and I'll look for that in the church um, week after week, and there's times you can see it. And so I wanted her, her perspective on how she stays encouraged with the, the, the no doubt in her own flesh the discouraging times have to come and the loneliness, um, as a result of the loneliness, I should say. Um, and then, of course, Sharon, with coming forward and, and going over her experience with the loss of her husband um, going back to 2018. Is that right? 2019, 2018, when she lost her husband. 2019, I believe, July. And then uh, my wife then finishing it up with, uh, you know, a, a pastor's wife and having to follow me from New Guinea to anywhere else and, 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 and things like that. And really more of an upbeat thing on staying encouraged. And so I thought they all really did an excellent job, and, and you, you, could, you could see it. I think it would be a help, people that were dealing with very real-life experiences and having to make a decision to stay encouraged, and then how they went about that process in their own life. We all have those times when discouragement hits. The danger is, is when it doesn't let go, 
when it just sort of stays and stays and stays and stays. That's a battle we face. We all go through those different times. Um, I, I've been through them many different times. I've, I, I won't go into the different events of them. I, I, again, one of the most discouraging time was right when Daniel, my oldest of my five children, left New Guinea. Um, that was a significant, what it represented to me was fairly enormous, was a major change in the family. For the first time, it wasn't the five of us. It was a major change for me. And he was my right-hand man. He was my entire help in the ministry there for the most part was Daniel. And so, and he was leaving. And then on top of it, we had several other events that hit at the exact same time. It wasn't just that. It was the, the works began to struggle. I, I, I wasn't seeing them going forward. I was seeing them pulling backwards. I had the man I was training to be a pastor followed in a sin. He disqualified himself, a guy I've been working with for years. And it was just an incredibly discouraging. We found out we were losing our house at the same time. And uh, uh, it was just, it was one of the most discouraging times that I've ever had. Um, I've had those times here. I remember, I remember one of the most times I was here, probably not, not quite a year yet. And I had a fellow call me up and said, listen, I'm in town. I need to come by and talk with you. Come on in. And it was one of the most discouraging meetings I've ever had in my life. I, I, when that meeting was over with, um, I just wanted to walk away. That's all I wanted to do. I wanted to just say, you know what? I am just going to get on a plane, <laughs> grab the family, and I'm going. That's what I'm going to do right now. And, and it was an incredibly discouraging time. And I knew if, if I'm going to be able to stand behind a pulpit, I, I've got to come out of that. I have to come out of that. I can't stay in that. And, and it's amazing at times what the Lord does do. Uh, sometimes, sometimes, and some of you don't even realize it, I can, I can think even around that exact same time frame, uh, one was very close to it, one was within weeks of it, two different notes I got, one letter and one note um, that was there. The people had no idea of what had taken place. None. And it was there. And I knew, of course, it was of the Lord. This morning, as we're trying to look at discouragement and encouragement during those times, I want us to look at Joshua. He is no doubt at a very discouraged time in his life. One of the commands coming to him from God is, be not dismayed. The Lord knows right where Joshua's at, exactly what he is thinking. I, I, I would imagine, I'm not certain, I, I don't know what all went on in his life. We only have, a, really, we only have some glimpses of Joshua's personal life. He is a man in the Bible that we know very little about his personal life and different things he faced. Um, but I do think that this is perhaps uh, the, uh, this time in his life where he's, it's been one of the hardest battles he is facing or up there. It, one of, it, it, just a major event in his life with the death of Moses. Um, a man who he has given his life for. Um, a man who was without a doubt one of his closest friends. A man that was also a father figure. A man that was his counselor, a man that he admired, a man that was his spiritual leader, has died. His life has been around Moses. You can imagine the discouragement that would come. And we also see in our text how the Lord helps him through it. The first time we're even introduced to Joshua, like I said, we don't get a good glimpse of him. It's in Exodus chapter 17. At a very young age, so we know the man has some wisdom. At a very young age, he's basically made general. Um, he is the man that Moses selects uh, um, to lead the battle that is to take place in Exodus chapter 17 against the Amicalites. He was in charge of the battle. He was the one to select the men to lead the battle. So this was a man that Moses at that time already had great confidence in. Now, poor guy was an orphan. He was the son of none. Hey, see, it worked. It's good. I got some laughs. Is that good enough for you? No, I got Ryan's my is my factor. He's saying no. <laughs> that was good timing. <laughs> Anyhow, well, the small glimpse of we have of him. This is my personal viewpoint. I think he was a very serious man. I think at times maybe too serious. Um, I think he was quiet. I, I don't think he was one of those outspoken type A personalities. I think he was very sober-minded. 
Um, keep in mind, this is a man at this point in his life that has actually witnessed a lot and a lot of horrific things. Don't forget who he is. He was involved in many battles already, many confrontations. He's a man that's seen a lot of blood. He is one who has sought out when, some, when someone has needed to throw something into the fray, Joshua is going to be that man. You can imagine what he saw. When they had battles at this time, it wasn't shooting from 75 yards away. This is with sword, with spears. This is, this is when you're usually killing somebody in battle here. He's inches from you. You're looking the guy in the eye when he dies. He's seen that. Time and time again. <clears throat> he's human. There's no doubt those things would have an effect on him, not only because he performed it, but because he was the leader of it. He was in charge. With leadership comes responsibility. There's a different weight that you carry, and Joshua carried that weight. In our text, he's referred to as Moses' minister. Again, he was Moses' servant before he was ever his successor. We see as we go through the life of Moses, wherever Moses was, you find Joshua. When he went to the mount, it's, it's Joshua's with him, but he stays down below. When he's outside the camp of this tent, you're going to see Joshua there. This was a confidant of Moses. You could just imagine the different conversations that these men have had during the years. This, this is the one man that I believe Moses would take aside and just when he needed to unload, he would unload on. This is the one man when they were just joking around. It, this, is, this is the fella. It would be Joshua. He'd have those. You can imagine the theological talks that he heard from Moses about God. Personally. I think another lesson we learned from Joshua, this is a whole side note. I, I want to go there. I, almost, I think I will do a sermon on that. We see the Lord always chooses the humble. Always chooses the humble in Joshua. <clears throat> Joshua was never looking for a title, never looking for a position, never look. He, was, he wasn't a look at me guy. He, he was a servant and was content with being a servant. <clears throat> Always by Moses' tent, but never disturbing him unless called upon. His devotion was incredible. To be honest, when you look through the scripture, he's very hard to find any fault with. Not as much as a Joseph or a Daniel, but right up there. A man of character. <clears throat> one of the 12 spies that was sent out in Numbers chapter 13, and of course, he, him and Caleb, the ones coming back saying, we got this. We got this. According to separate tradition, we can't go on the word of God with this, but of course, that he did marry, and that all of his children were daughters, that he did not have one son that was born unto him. And... Uh, um, it said that, uh, you know, it goes on. There's different things you can read by tradition. I'm not going to get too much into that. I have some of those things written here in my notes. And I, I, I just wonder if it wasn't of the Lord with everything he experienced and went through that he had all daughters, if that is in fact the case. So as we get into the book of Joshua, I believe Joshua's in a very discouraged state with the death of his mentor, of his friend, of his counselor, of his father figure, Moses. I think he's discouraged. And the Lord in here, what I want to pull from this text is just some things that we see. We're not going to go through all this text. It, this is, it, it, is, it is using this text, and I'm, I'm not going to depart from it, but it's not going through it expositorily, line upon line, precept upon precept. I just want to pull out things that the Lord used to encourage Joshua. So let me dive into that. The first point is the foundation for this, and, and let, let's start... Actually, let me, before, let me just jump right into it here. Um, well, I'll start, I'll start in verse 1. Let's look at verse 1 and 2. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, as soon as he addresses him, notice what the first command is given. I think that's key. Now, therefore, arise. Arise. This is, of course, God's call coming to the life of Joshua, officially being Moses' replacement. But what I'm going to focus on is the word to arise. 
if he's going to get through this and accomplish the will of God and do what he needs to do and come out of the discouragement, he has to arise. The command comes, but it's a decision that Joshua has to make. This, this is a conscious decision that Joshua has to make in his mind. I'm going to arise. I have no doubt when Joshua is hearing this, to some extent, it had to overwhelm him. He's used to being the servant. Now he's being asked to be in the place of leadership. Replacing one of the most amazing leaders that God has ever used. Of course, at, at this point, at all in history, but still uh, 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 in the history of the world. And he's replacing him. And Joshua knows being with Moses, he knows the weakness and the problems of the people. He knows what's facing him. He knows, as, as the Lord lists through what he has to accomplish through Joshua's mind, understand what's taking place. There's 31 kings he's going to have to do battle with. 31 armies. But the call comes, arise. Joshua, it's time to arise. Moses is dead, but it's time to arise. Joshua needs to move on. The work does not stop because Moses is dead. <clears throat> and again, when those discouraging times come to us, make no mistake, the Lord is coming over and over and saying, Arise. It's time to go forward. It's not easy. It's easy for me to preach this. But of course, it's not, it, it's a it's, it's a decision many times we want to make, but many times, just like Romans chapter 7 comes into play, finding the power to make that decision. What Joshua has to avoid here, if he's going to arise, is living in the past. Allowing, if he lives in the past, that discouragement will not go away. It'll stay. If he wants to stay, because this is a major event, this is a major change that is taking place. Life for him will no longer be the same. And when we have events like that take place, that's when we have trouble moving on. We can struggle with change. But the fact is, change comes in life. It does. It's part of it. This is a major change for Joshua. We're tempted during times of change to run or just live in the past. You know, I, and I am one that I, I do not, even though the Lord has used me with the military and everything else, I cannot stand change. Never have. I think that's why the Lord put me in the Air Force just like he did immediately. He knew with what he had for my life, I got to get this guy to, to be able to embrace change. Because I, I, I'm going back to fifth grade, first major change occurring was when we moved. We moved outside, of, we were in, we were in Book Park, right side, lived right by the airport, right by Cleveland Hawkins Airport I lived. I could walk to the fence of the airport. And we moved, to, uh, we moved out to a town called Amherst, about 20 miles down the highway. And I still remember pulling into that school Oh my goodness, the thing looked like a, something from the, a, you know, pre Noah days, just ugly, huge, nasty building. And I did not want to go in there. And I still remember going in there. I am nervous. I just want to throw up. What, I'm 10 years old, whatever it is, I'm 10. And I don't want to go through this. And I remember still standing there. My mom's there, and she's lying to the uh, principal, whoever it was there, asking about how good I was in school. I was average. Oh, he's excellent. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not excellent. And, uh, and so they put me in this, like, accelerated class. Like, that was a mistake. I'm telling you right now that this is a mistake. I do not need to be in here. I remember, still remember the teacher was Mr. Redman. Older guy with a full beard. And walking in that class of, like, 35 kids and not knowing one of them. Oh, my goodness. Horrible. I, I just wanted to go back to my school and my friends. That was all I wanted. I didn't like change. I didn't. And so many times when we're faced with a life event that signifies a change, we have trouble moving forward. The death of a spouse signifies a change. 
there's events that transpire that signify a change. The danger is not leaving the past. <clears throat> change comes. I want to try and give some help in moving on. When we have life events, and remember, there's going to time that comes. I, I told this to Heather. Heather is very similar to me when it comes to change. She cannot stand it. Uh, and I, I used to feel I could have so much compassion for her on debutation when she had to go into Sunday school class because I know how I would feel walking into that class and being so nervous and petrified, not knowing anybody. Well, that was Heather. Bethany was the opposite. Didn't care who it was. She would stand up and give a speech day one. But Heather wasn't that way. And we're in one church in Louisiana. There, there's just a lot of bad things in Louisiana, if you didn't know that, LSU and everything else. And so we're in a church in Louisiana, really good church, actually, a brother Silvertooth. We had him preach family camp one year. This is his church. And I'm, I'm, some of the, believe it or not, I'm getting older. The circumstances are getting a little bit foggy of this. I'm, I think I was teaching at the time. I can't quite remember if I was teaching or in the pew. I don't know why I'm confused about that. But it was Sunday school time. And I'm in the main auditorium, and I can, I can see this clearly. Heather was in a Sunday school class and comes running out of her class, middle of it, and just in tears. And anyhow, when she went into the new class, one of the other boys in the class decided to make fun of her over and over. And so she just lost it and ran out. You know, she didn't enjoy those changes, those things like that. Again, very, very similar to how I am. And so when you're faced with different times of change, you've got to be able to move forward, not stay in the past. So how do we do that? Because keep this in mind. Oh, I, I've lost the whole point of that story. I'm sorry. When Heather went to Utah, the day before we left, you know that she came to me, and I'm not kidding. She was dead serious. It's the day before she's getting on the plane, leaving the house to go teach in Utah. We had that job reserved for a year. All right, I wanted her with us for one year and then off to, the, off to the job. She graduated college. She comes to me the day before she's leaving. She said, I am not going. I don't want that job. I'm like, oh, no, you're going. <laughs> you make no mistake. Of me. You're getting on that plane. You're going. And uh, she said, no, I'm not. I am not going. And no, you are. And uh, so we're in Utah. And I can tell she's nervous. Now she has my compassion. I can see this is what she didn't want to go through, the change. And I said, and I told her, I said, Heather, the day's going to come that you're going to miss this. That day will come. Even though you're going through a change now in life, you're, if, if you embrace life in a different fashion, the day will come when another change occurs and you're going to miss this. You will. You will. But it helps for moving on. Number one, don't look back. Move forward. Move forward. Paul had to press toward that mark, forgetting those things which are behind. You have to make a decision to do just that, to say, listen, I, 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 you're not to live in the past. I have a whole sermon based on this. You're not to live in the past. You're to learn from the past. But too often we just live in it. But make the decision, I'm just going to learn from it. Most of us either have, and this can hinder, either way this can hinder you. Most, most of us either have a past to live up to or a past to live down. If your past is filled with fail, failure, certainly don't believe that's all you're going to do. You're believing lies of the devil. That's all you're doing. Don't let regret or bitterness destroy or take that because you're dwelling in the past. Don't think if you fail, the Lord will not use you. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 is just incredible. Every morning, his mercies are renewed. <clears throat> Learn from those past failures. Make the necessary changes. Many times, we allow those past failures to prevent us from moving forward. Peter could have did that. Guy failed over and over and over. Macy's store failed seven times before it caught on. Babe Ruth struck out 1,330 times. Again, I can think of the very first time I ever preached. It was a disaster. I don't know if you, most of you heard this story. It was a complete, there's not a person alive that heard me preach the first time but think God's calls on his life. 
No one. It was horrible. It was much worse than this. Oh, God, I got laughs out of that. I was going to get worried if nobody laughed about that. <laughs> Listen to me. This is very true. True success in life is based on our ability to get up after we have failed. It is. Being willing to get back into the present and go on. Don't get stuck dwelling upon the past and let it cripple you, cripple your present. Arise. Make the decision to go forward. Now, with that arise, the Lord then gives Joshua some help. And let me pull, let me pull some things from the help that he gave him. Verse 5 and 6. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. We have the same promise. Do you understand that? Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance, and it goes on from there. I'll stop reading right there. He promises them a couple things here to help them stay encouraged. Listen, you need to arise. You're going to make the decision, but as you're going forward by faith, this is what I want to do. One, you're going to have my protection. He basically tells them here, you're going to be invincible. He does. You're going to be invincible. And this is a promise for Joshua right here with what he's going to face in taking on 31 kings. He's saying, listen, as you're going forward in this, none of them are going to touch you. None of them. And, and he goes on to let them know, as long as you're walking with me, this is going to be the key to your success, is just following me, Joshua. As you follow me, you stay close to me, you concentrate in relationship with me, I'll take care of the rest. You'll be invincible. But you concentrate in your relationship with me. Don't dismiss that. I stress it over and over, but I am telling you, when I talk with people, it gets dismissed so quickly. The key is always going to be that walk and relationship with God because then you put the ball in his court. Don't try and take over. He promises protection. He promises his power to Joshua. He says, Joshua, I'm going to protect you, but you're going to have my strength here. For what I've, what I've called you to do, as I was with Moses, he said, so will I be with thee. Joshua understood what that meant. Joshua was there when they came out of Egypt. He saw the Red Sea part. He witnessed it. He walked on dry ground with a wall of ocean water on each side. He knew what it meant when God said, as I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. It's a promise of God's power. He was there when the manna started and God's provision was in place for everyone. He saw when God's presence filled the tabernacle, the awe that that produced. He saw when Moses came off the mount and the glow that was about him for meeting with God. He saw the wisdom that God gave Moses. So he knew when God said, as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. So what he's doing is, he's getting getting Joshua to place it. Joshua, these these are the areas I need your mind to go. Not on the past, but on this. He's telling him, Joshua, I'm going to help you. And the Lord is, is the one with the power to help. You see, I'm not Joshua. I'm not taking on 31 kings. I'm not a general. Oh, I assure you, you have your own enemies to conquer. I assure you, there's many battles you have to face. There's many different kings that are running around in your own heart and mind that you need to conquer. The depression, the anxiety, the fear. It's time to conquer those and arise. 
Because God gives the grace and power needed to do just that. He also promised him, of course, his present. I'm not leaving you. Yeah, that's right. That's the most important one here. God reminds him, listen, I am right there. And what a great encouragement that is. He is there. Don't ever think God has left you because he has not. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That is true. It makes all the difference when you know God is there. It does. The promise of his presence is critical. You know, I, I've mentioned it several times. I, right now, come to mind is when we were going through Philippians and we, and we, we got into uh, Philippians chapter 4. And out of the blue, the Apostle Paul makes this statement. He's given instruction to the church, the series as the chapter begins. And just out of the blue, it doesn't seem to fit, fit context when you first go through. He says, the Lord is at hand. He's that and remind him, listen, God is there. He is makes all the difference. And he was facing those battles. Again, I think of this, I think I brought this up one other time, but I, it, it, it's come to mind. I remember when I was, I was eight or nine years old. Yeah, nine, I believe. And I had to fight Casey. Oh, man. He's like one of the toughest kids in school. And I'm still scrawny. I can scrap, but I'm still scrawny as anything. I probably weigh like 12 pounds. And I'm a rail. And, and, I don't know what happened, but we were usually best friends. We were usually around all the time, but something happened, so we're going to fight. We're going to meet. We, between his house and my apartment building was a playground. We're being at the playground this time to fight. And I did not want to fight him because I knew I was going to lose. <laughs> and so I, I was nervous as anything. I can't believe, man, what have I done? And I'm already experiencing pride at nine years old, <laughs> all right? And so when I, when I headed out, I, I'm, I'm heading there to it. And I'm, and I'm nervous, but it changed because all of a sudden I see follow me is my brother who we didn't, remember, we did not get along. We never got along until I was married. <laughs> he's three years older than me. My mom only had the two, the two of us. That was it. So when you're the younger of a brother who's three years older than you, I, I was the pest. You know, I was the one he, he didn't want around. So we didn't get along. But nonetheless, he found out who I was fighting. I'm sure he was like, oh, this is not going to go well. <laughs> And so he was following. Do you know what peace that gave me because he was there? I mean, I knew I wasn't going to get beat to a pulp. I knew he wasn't going to let it get out of hand when it happened. But it gave me a measure of courage, a measure of boldness just because his presence was there. Listen, it's very true in your life. If you'll begin to remember, as God reminds his people over and over and over from Genesis to Revelation that I am there. It does provide an amazing amount of encouragement. The whole point of that Dorito story, let me see the Doritos, was just God reminding me, I know, I'm there. It's all right. <clears throat> so from Joshua and God's word, we see some things that, that, keep desert, that can keep discouragement strong in your spirit. One is looking back, not accepting change. It'll keep discouragement strong in your spirit. Standing still and doing nothing will keep discouragement strong in your spirit. Or three, just giving up. Giving up. Now, in verse 8 and 9 are some of the most, I'm going to finish with this. I want to concentrate just for, just for a couple of minutes on verse 9. Verse 8 and 9, of course, most of us here could quote these two verses. We learned them very quickly. And I do remember uh, the very first time I ever, ever read the book of Joshua, and this is one of the chapters that just sh struck out at me. I mean, I mean, just struck me very strong, I should say. But it says, This book of the law should not depart of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make the way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. So he gets some final words here to Joshua before he goes on to encourage him. To say, listen, arise, go forward, this is what we're going to do. And again, he, he reminds him again what we just finished with, of his presence. He says, listen, I'm the one commanding you. It's me. Think of the ones commanding you to do this. This isn't coming as a vote of the people or anything else. This is coming from me. 
The one who knows you more than anybody, who knows what you can do. I know your limitations. I know your strengths. I know you better than you do. And I'm the one commanding you, go. That makes a big difference when you understand who it is commanding you to arise. He says, I am the one commanding you. Again, as I'm coming today and, and different things that you're struggling with and saying arise, it's not the pastor telling you because you're right, I don't know you, but it is the Lord. You think he wants you to stay in that state? Of course not. He wants you to arise and go forward. If he's giving the command, he gives the ability and the power and the grace to do it. He knows all about you. He knows what you can do through him. And Philippians 4.13 comes into play. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. He is the one giving the orders. That makes all the difference in the world. When you know God is in it. He tells him, don't be afraid. Fear can keep you discouraged. Because fear will either keep you in the past, it'll keep you still, you don't want to move on. Fear of failure, fear of letting others down, fear of what others will think. And it cripples you. Again, I think of the fear I had right before I left for New Guinea and how crippling it was. Here's a quote. I still remember... I don't know why I never came across it. It, it. Little did I realize when I first read this quote, well, I was already in New Guinea when I read this quote. I was reading a book, trying to think of the name of the book. It was written by a pastor. I was going through the book. Excellent book, though. I can't remember the name of it, but it was such a help in my personal life. And this quote was in the book. Little did I know how famous this quote was. And even though I love history, I don't ever remember coming across it until I read that book. So I'm probably, I don't know, 35 years old when I read this thing. But it's a quote from Theodore Roosevelt. And it, it says this. It says, It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or the doer of the deeds could have done done better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error or shortcoming. But who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself for a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who knew neither victory nor defeat. That's a really good quote by Theodore Roosevelt. Fear many times what cripples you of going forward. He tells him, be not dismayed, directly hitting his discouragement now. Again, all of us know how debilitating at times discouragement can be. How it can take your physical strength and your energy right from you. I think of many times those who come to my office so discouraged. And even in the midst of discouragement, ready to make major decisions. And there's times in, in trying to guide and direct and not increase discouragement and trying to, trying to realize, oh, you just made such a, 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 out of discouragement, such a poor decision. Such a poor decision. That now can have consequences that are going to hurt you in the future. So often we make these quick decisions when discouragement hits. So we see here, as I want to finish this up, how that discouragement comes. We can reverse it, all right? Think about this. One, you forget God is there. You forget about his presence. You forget what this is all about. Because uh, he, he's the one that's never going to leave you nor forsake. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. You, you, you simply forget what it's all about. You forget he is there. You stay focused on the eternal, on God himself, the one who will never change. People will. Institutions will. Life changes. But the Lord God changes not. 
Knowing God is there, boy, that helps prevent fear. It provides courage. Again, think back to when Peter got out of the boat. Remember, two reasons he got out of the boat, only two reasons. He said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come on the water. The Lord replies, Peter, come. Two things, two reasons he got out of the boat. God's presence, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come on the water. Two, he had the command, come. That's what's critical. Knowing God is there, having him as you arise and come and go forward. I'll finish with this. David came to mind, and that is, David was another man when we went through his life that had a lot of ups and downs. David had times where, as he said, he had to encourage himself in the Lord. There were times where there wasn't an outside help that, that uh, carnally speaking or in a relationship here on this earth speaking, when he had to simply encourage himself in the Lord. He knew, I can't stay like this. He saw what it did in, in previous decisions in his life. He knew, I have to arise. So he had to encourage himself in the Lord, even if circumstances didn't change. And I have no doubt he would then would remember all that God did for him. You can think him going back to his teenage years and seeing Goliath, thinking, man, look what the Lord did. Thinking back to where here, here he is, late teenage years, early 20s, leading an army in battle. The man with the wisdom for it. Incredible. Thinking of all the times God worked in his life. Remembering God's grace in his life, the times that God was there for him. In other words, he was following Psalm 103. Forget not all the Lord's benefits. That's what he was doing. Don't forget the Lord's benefits. Read Psalm 103. Go through it.